Hello, um, my name is Professor Dorothy Bishop, and I'm going to be presenting you with a series of short recorded lectures, trying to take you through some of the basics of simulation, but allowing you to follow some exercises along as we go, as well as then giving you little breaks in which you might want to do further exploration. And the idea is that we'll have several of these all quite short that you can do in your own time, you can follow along. And then there will be a session, an interactive session on Teams uh, where we can try and ha have questions and answers and the rest of it. So I'm going to be trying to share my screen and hopping a little bit between PowerPoint and other applications, um, just so that you can actually see how things are done. The idea is to just give you some really very basic um, introduction to data simulation, because often people think of it as something very complicated that only sort of mathematical whizzes can do. And that's very far from being the case. Um, and the reasons that I think one should be simulating data, there's really many of them, but it's all about getting confidence in understanding about the sort of analyses that you do and getting deeper insights than you would get just from being taught about, say, mathematical formulae. I think the things I have found very useful about simulation is it can help you anticipate what your data will look like um, if you start trying to run a project and you try and first of all make a simulated data set of what you think the data might end up looking like, it really already starts giving raising a lot of questions typically about the study design and what measures you're collecting and so on. So that is really quite useful as a sort of thinking ahead sort of mechanism. And then if you've got a simulated data set, and it, that forces you into being much more concrete about what you might consider in terms of planning and analysis for your data. Um, you might get a sense of what's optimal, uh, what's a better analysis or a worse analysis. And again, quite often it will just throw up questions that you might not have anticipated when you were first uh, setting out. Also simulated data is very, very useful for doing something called power analysis, which is essentially, um, it involves what sample size you should use. It's, it's really not just about sample size, but sample size is very key in power analysis. And very often people do use sample sizes that are rather too small to address the questions that they're interested in. And it can really flag up when you're doing that. And then it's also a very good way of understanding what is the meaning of these p-values that are used in many contexts in science. Um, and it explains why quite often they're misinterpreted and why something called p-hacking is, is really quite a big problem. Uh, and again, this is, becomes much more evident when you've got a simulated data set. Now, you can simulate data in many different ways. You really just need any sort of program that will generate random numbers. And I'm going to actually introduce the general ideas behind simulation using Excel, which is very much derided by many people uh, as far too primitive and also it's got problems if you use it for data analysis, it can actually introduce errors into your analysis. So Excel is not the favorite tool for many people, but actually for introducing you to simulation, I think it's great. It's, it really allows you to get straight in there, generate some numbers and start seeing how they behave. So we'll start with that. Um, and those of you who are already familiar with more sophisticated types of uh, programs like R or MATLAB uh, may sort of feel that you could skip this. But I think it also, even so, doing things in Excel gives you a very core idea of what it is you're doing. And we will then move on to try and get you into R, which is much more complicated. And there's a steeper learning curve. It's, it's you know, a bit over ambitious of me to really suggest that if you have never done anything in R that you might be able to cope with this, but I think you have to put your toe in the water and this is a good opportunity for you to at least try and there will be some of us around for the interactive session who might be able to help you if you get stuck. R is immensely powerful and very, very useful for doing, if you're really going to do simulation seriously, you'll probably start needing to use it, but it might give you a sense of whether or you want to take it further. You can do things in SPSS and you could do things in MATLAB, which I won't go into here, but this is just to make it clear that whatever is your favorite way of working, 
typically simulation is possible and there will be tutorials you can find online for doing this. But we're going to try with very primitive little Excel. The basic idea behind simulation um, is when you're doing science, uh, if you're a physicist, you might be trying to do something like estimate a very, very precise number, a constant or something. But in most sort of bio, biomedical types of field and social science fields, um, we're really studying natural phenomena where what we're looking for is a signal that is embedded in some noise. So there's a lot of variation that's not of interest, but we think that there's an effect nevertheless over and above the sort of more random variation that you see. And the goal of research could be described as finding out whether there is an effect of interest, and if so, how big is it? And indeed, what direction does it go in? Most of you will, I think, have learned, insofar as you've learned statistics, you'll have probably learned about what's known as the classic null hypothesis significance testing approach, where you say, well, how likely is it that this particular pattern of data would have arisen if really the null hypothesis was true and there was no effect of interest, that was just random noise. Um, and that's really where people use p-values, which gives you an estimate of the probability that the effect that you're looking at uh, could have arisen from a random data set. And what we can do in simulation is we can actually simulate random data sets and see how often we might get supposedly significant looking p-values. And that is one goal of this course is to really give you a very strong sense of how important it is to do things properly in order not to generate spurious p-values or spurious significance type one errors. And I hope to show you how very easily you can do that if you don't play by the rules and a lot of science is generating false positives uh, because people bend the rules in how they do things. The other thing you can do is you can simulate genuine effects. So you can say, okay, maybe you're thinking about a drug effect and you think it has uh, an effect of, um, I don't know, you know, a third of a standard deviation uh, in terms of say reducing anxiety. Um, you can also simulate that. So you can simulate a data set with and without the effect of the drug in it. And then you can do your statistics on that. And using that approach, you can also get a sense of how easy it can be to miss effects that are, are really there. You know the effect is really there because you simulated it. But sometimes uh, there will be situations where when you run your statistics, you don't see that effect. So it's important to do it both way rounds. And this first uh, part of the course will focus on um, simulating null data sets and then we'll move on to look at what happens when you simulate real effects. But the basic idea in Excel um, is that you can start by simulating a bunch, of, a bunch of random numbers. And there is a function in Excel that will do that for you. Uh, it's called rand, and it generates random numbers between naught and one. And I'm gonna just sort of now uh, move to show you my other screen with Excel on it. So I can show you what we're doing here. So the idea is you have a, uh, this comp column that says formula. I've just really put that in there to remind you how you're getting this column of random numbers, which is by putting in this very simple little formula. You can see I've typed in equals rand. And what you're seeing here is if you type equals rand, you get a number, but it varies every time you do it. And that I was just, you can always extend the formula down by just grabbing that little box and pulling like that. Um, so I'd like you to try that on your own uh, computer. I'll just complete this to match that, just type this in without the equals, that's just so that you can see the formula that has generated those numbers. It's just to explain it. I've gone down a bit further, I've gone down to 12. But you can see that um, these numbers there just varying between naught and one. Some of, the, some of them are big, some of them are little. So I hope you've managed to do that. So we'll go back to PowerPoint and just nip down to the next slide. Um, and one of the points that I'm making here is that the numbers will change whenever you open the worksheet or indeed when you make any change to it. You could see if I type another number here, another, 
all the numbers change. So it just keeps uh, updating every time the worksheet changes. Sometimes you don't want it to do that. You, you actually want to generate some random numbers so that don't hop about like that because you might want to do other things with them. And you can do that by um, selecting an option up here. I'll have to pull this out, but it's in formulas, the calculation options. So somewhere along here, there's formulas. I can find it. Yeah, formulas, um, calculation options over here, and you can do manual. Now, it's quite important if you do this and you are an Excel user that you remember to put it back when you finish doing this exercise, because otherwise you can get the horrible experience of finding that weird things happen because it's not updating. Um, it, the default would be that you would have automatic up here. So if you don't have automatic, uh, strange things happen. But for our purposes, we've set it to manual. And that just means that I can add another one down here now. And these ones above it didn't change. They don't all hop around. So you can actually keep your original set of numbers. OK, so and I should say these slides will also be available if you want to review them. Um, so the next question is, these numbers that we've created here, are they the kind of numbers you want if you're, if you're thinking of an experiment that you're doing and you're simulating some data? Um, are they, would, would you want to have numbers like this between naught and one uh, as representations of, of what your data is like? It may be that you do, but it's rather, it, it would be a rather a particular type of experiment, say, where you wanted perhaps to know what the proportion, a proportion between naught and one. Maybe you, you know, you're looking at cells and how many cells have responded to something. And this might be a reasonable way to do it. But in many, many situations, we would not expect a distribution like this. We would actually be looking for a different type of distribution. And that would be um, a more normal distribution. So what would the data look like? Um, what's the commonest kind of distribution for raw data? It's normally distributed data where, and this is usually because where, whenever you've got multiple influences on uh, any kind of process, uh, things cancel each other out and you end up with something more like a normal distribution, which you can see here. I can make that full screen. Um, and there's many advantages if you're simulating data of working with normally distributed data, um, although it might not always be appropriate for your particular situation, we're going to focus mainly on that. And that means that you're going to want to generate numbers which are known as Z-scores, or if you're American, Z-scores, uh, which just are giving you an estimate of how far from the mean of the distribution the value is in terms of standard deviation units. So a Z-score of one is one corresponds to one standard deviation above the mean, or minus one, one standard deviation below the mean. And we know from the normal distribution that the, number, the proportion of values that you would have for normally distribu distributed data with particular values of Z score. So the further away from the mean you get, the rarer it is to find that type of score. And the P, uh, the probability is the area under the curve to the left of a given Z score. So you can actually, there's a really direct com conversion if you've got normally distributed data from the z-score to the p-value, the probability that that uh, value will have been observed. Now, this is uh, a clue to how easy it is actually to go from um, the values that you've uh, generated already in Excel to create z-scores. We know that this RAND um, uh, formula generates uniform numbers from 0 to 1. All of them are equally probable. We can actually say they are like p-values, okay? So um, just probabilities which vary from 0 to 1. And you can turn um, a p-value into a z-score with this function called norms, in, which is the inverse of the normal distribution. So let me just come out of that package and go back here. So here I've got my random number. If I now um, take the value which is the normal inverse of that random number, 
we get a z score. So well, I want to go here, this one, B2. So now you've got a negative number. And if I uh, copy that formula down, um, ah, it hasn't changed. And that is because we have set that thing to automatically, this thing up here, calculation options. And we actually want it now to, um, to calculate it. So we need to, um, we can go back to automatic or we can, there is a, an option that we're going to see on the next slide to do that without having to go in and out of that particular option. But what you can see now is that what we have using this norms inverse function is we converted from a probability value to a Z score. Probabilities less than 0.5 are negative and those greater than 0.5 are positive and the bigger they are the more positive they are so have a look at that for a bit and this is really bringing home already i think the basic nature of, of normally distributed data that uh, you have these more extreme z scores which have lower probability just as i showed you in the previous slide okay so what I've suggested at this point is that you take a little break to explore this more and extend your column of Z scores so you have around 100 values. And I showed you here, if you want to sort of actually just extend something, you can grab that little square and pull it pull down like that. Uh, again, we need to go up here and turn it on automatic to get that back. Um, and then I've suggested that you highlight all the Z scores. You need to pull that formula down as well for 100. Like that. Um, and then go to insert chart histogram and you'll create a little histogram. Um, and I want you then to look at how that varies. Um, yes, it's calculate now to the right of the menu bar that you need to do when you've got this set like manual to the right of the menu bar. It's probably right over here. Uh, calculation options, I think, there we are, calculate now. So every time you press that little calculate now button, even though you've set that to be manual, that is that allows you to recalculate it. So what we're going to ask, what I want you to do in your exercise is to play about with this, um, changing it and looking at how the histogram changes every time you do calculate now. Um, and then I also want you to think it's very useful when you're doing simulation to make changes, but before you make the change to think whether you can predict what effect that would have. And so if you use, instead of these numbers, which are your Z scores, um, from this formula, norms inverse, if you were to actually do a histogram using these numbers, what would that look like? So play about with both of those. And this should already be giving you a more intuitive feel for what a z-score is and what a, a p-value is. So that's the end of this little chunk of lecture. And we'll come back again um, for a bit more um, in, uh, at your own convenience when you feel ready to continue. <laughs>